In this video, we're going to cover the actual content from video SP 4.1 to SP 4.5. And all of this is basically the fourth context point for the Search for Better Health module. This is your syllabus link, so you can see it's a fourth context point. And here, these are the ones we're going to cover in this video. We're going to cover the verbs, so I think it's underlined here in red. And we're going to link that those verbs to contents, hopefully explain to you exactly what you need to know for those top points. And also, here are some links where you can jump to that actual section that is covered. And you can just jump fast forward if you want to know just one of the top points as opposed to all of them. So the first one we're going to cover is identify the fence barriers to prevent entry of pathogens in, in humans, including the skin, mucous membranes, cilia, and chemical barriers in other body secretions. So in this case, we need to talk about identified defense barriers, which means more or less name or recognize defense barriers. Remember, this was the first line of defense. And the first line of defense is just something that prevents pathogens from actually getting into our body. Uh, into, and into our blood. So here we have the skin, and obviously the skin covers the vast majority of our body, and the, the skin is going to be really important. And then there are some openings as well, such as the mouth, for example, the anus, and the eyes and the ears, and that's going to be covered by something called the mucous membrane, right? So the skin is going to be covered first. The skin helps to make sure pathogens don't get into our blood. Right? But there are a thick layer of dead cells, and that's really important. So you can see there's quite a thick layer of dead cells, which means these pathogens won't be able to just get past them. They can't penetrate. Also, that whole environment is quite dry, which means dryness is not bad, not good for reproduction. So these actual pathogens can't grow and reproduce on that dry surface. And also, there's good skin microflora. So good skin microflora means there are good bacteria. So these green dots are meant to be good bacteria. What these green uh, these good bacteria do, they take space and they would change the pH. So they take space away from the actual pathogens. They can't grow anymore because they can't find any space to grow. And also, they change the pH, which means the environment is not suitable for the other pathogens to grow as well. Right? So these are examples of how the skin actually helps us to prevent um, pathogen growth. Then we also have the, the mucous membrane. Again, the mucous membrane is the lines, the openings. So there's a lining of the openings. And this lining is usually, at, for example, the, the mouth and the anus, the um, giant and the penis tract and all that kind of stuff. Anywhere else where there has to be an opening for food to come out, for urine to come out, for a for anus to come, for feces to come out, right? There has to be an opening, and that is the mucous membrane makes sure that even though there's an opening, there's less pathogens that can actually get into our body or into our blood. So what the mucous membrane does is it produces mucus, right? So these would be purple ones would be the mucous membrane producing cells, and they would produce this bluish liquid, which is slimy mucus. And what slimy mucus does, it has, first of all, it has antimicrobial properties. These antimicrobial properties just means that it kills pathogens that try to um, st stay there or, or hook on. And also it prevents attachment because there's basically there's some um, chemicals inside which don't allow the actual pathogens to hook on to those cells. And if they can't hook on, they can't grow. Uh, so that's how the mucous membrane basically prevents pathogens from growing in those openings of our body. And then we also have the cilia. The cilia can be found only in one location, which is the trachea and the rest, and the rest of the respiratory tract. So that would be this in this area here. And basically, what it does is there are these hair-like structures. You can see these hair-like structures here. So they'd be on your normal mucous membrane, which you know you've got in your mouth, the anus, and everywhere else. You've got some of in some locations, just those locations I mentioned earlier, the trachea, and the respiratory tract. You've got this hair. What they do is, if you've got, for example, trapped dust or pathogens, you have them trapped, and uh, you want to make sure they get back out again, you want to cough them out, so you have to bring them upwards, and that's done by these hair-like structures called the cilia, and that will eventually move all the way up to the mouth, and then you cough it out. Right? So that's what the cilia do, they make sure the pathogens, the dust particles and pathogens get back up to the throat, and then you cough them out. Then there are other parts, so the chemical secretions and other body secretions are, for example, your stomach acid and your urine. These would be two examples of chemical secretions that have a very low pH, and that means any enzymes will become denatured, so that's usually the end for a lot of bacteria, and sometimes it just directly kills other pathogens as well. So these are two barriers to the entry in terms of uh, any pathogens into our blood. And we also have the tears. The tears would be a form of body secretion that basically is antimicrobial, so anything on our eye, any pathogen, often die if we start tearing up. Right? So these are three examples of chemical barriers and body secretions. And all of these were our first line defense. 
Next stop point is identify antigens as molecules that trigger the immune response. Again, identify just means name and or recognize. So we need to recognize that antigens are molecules that trigger the immune response. So first of all, you should know, you should know that antigens can be found on any foreign body, so any foreign particle, cell, or pathogen. Uh, they're basically these molecules that stick out, and they can be different. Every single um, different type of pathogen in the cell might have a slightly different type of antigen. But the one thing they all have in common is when they're detected, they all trigger a immune response, right? So for example, we have this white blood cell, which might, hear, might be a phagocyte. And it has this antigen recognition molecule, which means that it, when it goes around and looks for anything that it can hook onto, then it can start the immune response once it has, right? So for example, the virus here, again, the virus is your, your pathogen that can cause problems when it infects, when it infects cells. And it has these antigens here, which were meant to be the same ones as these ones here. And once they get detected by a white blood cell, they will start the immune response, right? Because the antigen recognition molecule will bind to the antigen and thereby start that whole cascade. Next dot point was explain why organ transplants should trigger an immune response. In this case, explain why more or less just means show why. A couple of things you should um, sort of keep in mind. So first of all, I said that foreign particles, cells, or pathogens all have antigens. Also, that antigens trigger the immune response. So when they are detected, they trigger the immune response. And transplanted organs are made up of foreign cells. So foreign cells have antigens. When antigens are detected, they have the immune. They, they start the immune response. And transplanted tissue are actually foreign cells. So when you put an organ into someone. They are foreign cells that have more or less, according to our immune system, invaded our body. So they'll be detected by our immune system, our blood cells. And those antigens will then trigger the immune response, and that means they will actually be attacked. They will be killed, the white blood cells will be killed. And not the white blood cells, but the organs will be destroyed by our own immune system. And then the next one is identify. Again, this, in this case, it means that it's name recognized. Identify defense adaption, adaptations, including um, inflammation response, phagocytosis, the lymph system, the cell death to seal off pathogens. Again, we need to name or recognize these different ones, so we need to be able to know a bit about them. The first one is inflammation. And if you, for example, have a wound, so if someone actually has a knife which just stabs a bit of, of skin, that means that first barrier is, is destroyed, the skin is damaged. Now we might have pathogens um, coming into our body and causing damage to cells, right? So this might cause damage to cells. And when these damaged cells are um, damaged, and these cells are damaged, they will release chemicals. So our damaged cells will release chemicals. And what these chemicals do is these chemicals will then start the inflammation response. What the inflammation response actually is, is we've got an increase in body temperature, so that's fever. And the fever will basically destroy, or not destroy, but slow down the reproduction of, for example, bacteria, because the enzymes don't work as well as they used to in those bacteria. Also, the whole area will swell up because more water will go from the white, from the actual plasma into the infected area. We also have the blood vessels become more dilated. So here you can see this is supposed to be before it became inflammation. The response started and now they're a bit thicker. The reason being is because the thicker they are, the more blood will rush to that area. And that means there are more white blood cells will also rush to that area, and which is important to fight the actual infection. And last but not least, we have these blood vessels become more leaky, which basically means there's, there's more holes that appear in those blood vessels because these white blood cells need to be able to pass through these, these blood vessels. And that can only happen if there's some holes. So that's what the inflammation response does. It makes a few holes, makes it a bit more leaky, so the white blood cells can pass through. And all this does, it helps us just fight off an infection. So that's the inflammation response. Then the phagocytosis, and phagocytosis is basically if we have a phagocyte, an example of a phagocyte would be a macrophage, and what these phagocytes do is they engulf, and then they destroy pathogens, right? So they destroy them by basically engulfing them and then digesting them. There's a couple of stages. First, there's the attachments. So here you can see the actual phagocyte, and you've got a bacterium in this case, so an antigen-containing particle being attached. Then it will be engulfed, so you can see it's almost eating it. It's the second step, engulfing. And then it will be killed by lysosomes. Lysosomes will be um, releasing chemicals and enzymes that will digest it. And once it's destroyed, we basically have all of that debris being put back into the fluid and eventually that, that debris will be cleaned out. And one thing that, for example, cleans that debris will be the lymph system. 
is what the lymph system does. It basically cleans fluid between tissues. So you can see here we have blood supply and the blood supply is going to supply all of our tissues or all of our cells. And between that, those cells, we've got this fluid as well, which needs to get cleaned on a regular basis. And what this fluid is cleaned by is the lymph system. So you can see all of these green vessels here. This is meant to be the lymph, um, lymph vessels, which clean that area. So we've got all of this actual fluid eventually will return to the heart via those lymph vessels. But along the way, we can find just little, little nodes, so little pockets. And we, these pockets we call lymph nodes. And these lymph nodes are an important part of the immune system because what they do is if any of these actual, the yellow part here is meant to be a pathogen, if any of them get towards past the lymph node, at the lymph node we've got lots of white blood cells, especially T and B lymph sites, and those will actually destroy pathogens once they get past them. Right, so once they get to past the lymph node. So the lymph node is also part of the immune response, or immune system, that helps us deal with pathogen invasions. In this case, anything that has invaded our uh, interstitial fluid, which is the fluid between the actual tissue or cells. The last one we have is a cell death to seal off pathogens. In this case, if we have an infection which might be too severe to stop normal ways, we might have a white blood cells, which are meant to be these ones here, surround an infected area, which is meant to be these copper cells in the middle, and then basically they will kill themselves. So it's programmed cell death to seal off an infected area. And once that happens, that means those pathogens cannot escape from the area, and eventually when the actual cells die, pathogens die as well. So it just stops a crazy infection from causing any more problems. Right, so these were the four uh, examples of the second line defense. Once something has gotten into our body, once they have passed the first line defense, what happens is these four things. And then the last one is gather, process, and present information, which just means we need to be able to collect information and then also find out if it's valid and reliable. Um, to show how a named disease results from an imbalance of microflora, in this case, show more or less means explain. So we need to go through a couple of steps of how a disease results from an imbalance of microflora. And the disease that results in this case, the example we're going to use is thrush, the scientific name being candidiasis, and that's caused by a fungus called C. albicans. And what happens here is normally we have normal microflora. These are the ones here. The, the ones in green are normal microflora. This means they're good bacteria. So these good bacteria usually make sure there's less space for the actual fungi to grow, so that if it tries to actually hook on, it doesn't succeed, there's no space. But if, for example, we overuse antibiotics, what these antibiotics can do is they will target bad and good bacteria, so they could kill off some of the good bacteria. And the problem is now, now we have an imbalance of the microflora, because we used to have all the, the whole place covered with good bacteria, now there's an imbalance because there's less than there should be. And what happens now is that the actual same fungi that couldn't attach beforehand can find places to attach, and reproduce, and all of a sudden we have a disease. So the disease happens because of an imbalance of microflora, and this disease was thrush, and that was the example of thrush. So hopefully this was just a kind of a summary of the last five um, actual slip stop points of that fourth context point. But hopefully that gave you a bit of an insight in terms of what you need to know.